Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're all well. Thank you for joining us on the History um, Subject Admissions webinar. Um, on the bottom of your screens, you should see something that says raise hand. Please can you raise your hand if you can see and hear me? Brilliant. Everybody can see and hear me. That's wonderful. Um, so welcome again. Thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Catriona and I'm the School Liaison Officer at Fidelman College and I've organised the event, the event for you all today. Uh, so why are we running this webinar? Um, so my role as School Liaison Officer is uh, to help students like you uh, to understand the admissions process um, and to get you to consider applying uh, to Cambridge and to Downing. And we hope that in um, a couple of years time and next year that you will um, consider applying um, to us and hopefully some of you will come and join us in the future. So today then, uh, what's going to happen, I'm joined uh, by three other people. Um, so I'm going to hand over to the um, admissions tutor, Dr Cameron Eunice, and he's going to talk to you about the admissions process uh, for applying for history. Then I'm going to hand over um, to Dr David Pratt, and he's going to talk to you about the history subject overview, and give you an overview of the course here at Cambridge. And then finally, um, we've got Lamorna, who's one of our first year history students, and she's going to talk to you about uh, studying um, history at Cambridge and at Downing. So a few things to remember, um, if you keep your microphones and cameras off, they should already be off, um, but please do keep them off. Um, we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can today and please feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat and you can put questions in there um, throughout all the talks and we will have a Q&A session at the end. Um, we can answer your questions by typing your answers so do keep going back um, to check the Q&A box and see whether we've typed an answer to your question or another person has asked a similar question to you. So what is Downing College then? Obviously we're organising um, today's event and this is our site in the middle of Cambridge. Um, so we're one of the 31 Cambridge colleges um, that are part of the University of Cambridge. Um, we were founded in 1800 and we were the 17th college um, to be founded. We're a medium sized college. Um, we have 450 undergraduate students and we have around 120 new students joining us each year. And these students are from a range of different subjects and all subjects that are taught at the University of Cambridge. So I'm going to hand over uh, to Dr. Cameron Yunus now, who's going to talk to you about um, the admissions process. So, so good afternoon everybody. My name is, as Catherine has mentioned, my name is Cameron Yunus. I'm the admissions tutor at Downing College. And what I'd like to do today is really kind of go through some, a few areas of, of discussion. So the first thing is I'd like to really talk a little bit about the university. In particular, try and explain to you what purposes are of the department and what is the role of a college within the context of the University of Cambridge. And I'll also be able to tell you a little bit about the admissions process, what's involved, what sort of things we look for when we are selecting candidates to make offers for and so forth. And I, there isn't, this doesn't really apply to history, but the admissions assessments, there are some subjects which have admissions assessments, but we won't be talking much about that today. But however, for history, we do require students to submit some written work, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, and then hopefully, I'll have, if we have some time, I'll mention a little bit some, some, some advice and some pointers about personal statements and a little bit of information about what to expect if you do come for an admissions interview at the University of Cambridge. So a little bit about the university. When you uh, do join the university as a student, student, you are a member of the university uh, and are a member of a certain department where you're studying. At the same time, you're going to be a member of a college where you'll be admitted to. So what are the roles of the two individual sort of organisations, if I could call them that? It's just something I just wanted to touch on. So what does the role of the departments do? So the departments are there to set the course. Uh, they provide all the lectures, all the seminars. If you are doing any kind of assessments, any practical work, any project work, they're the place where they're all organized and, and taught. The departments are also responsible for setting the assessments for the students. So they're the ones which will set your exams, any kind of assessed coursework will be marking them and grading you. And eventually based on those grades, they'll be awarding your degrees, telling you what degree classifications you've got. 
And the departments are also there to provide career advice and, and so forth as well. So that's really what the department's there is to kind of set the curriculum for the academic work and the content for the course that you're studying. And in contrast, what the colleges do is work in complement to that. So what the colleges are primarily there for is to provide a place for students to come and live and to provide a place where their students can have all the support mechanisms in place whilst they're doing their undergraduate studies. So at Cambridge, the way it works is the colleges are actually responsible for doing all the selection and admissions to the students. So when you apply to the university, your application goes to a college. If you've chosen one college, it will go to the one you've chosen. If you've got an open application in, you are allocated to a college. And that college then reviews your application and makes a decision about whether they should be inviting for an interview. Once you've been invited for an interview, they then go through the process of seeing whether you should be selected for an offer. And if you then are successful in meeting your offer, you would be admitted to that college when you first arrive to the university. And while you're at the college, they will provide you all your accommodation facilities. They'll also provide all the dining facilities, any kind of sports facilities, social recreation facilities are all provided by the college. But also, while you're studying at the university, the college also assigns you a director of studies. What the director of studies is primarily there for is to kind of oversee your academic progress through your undergraduate years at the university. They're there to help you and mentor you through your undergraduate studies and to make sure you are on track to achieving the grades that you should do for your academic work. Apart from a director of studies, you also have a personal tutor that's assigned to you. Now the personal tutor is there in a very different capacity. They're there to provide pastoral care. So effectively, if you run into any kind of problems whilst you're studying at the university, your college tutor is there to support you and guide you through that. To kind of give you an example of that, if you are studying for, while you're studying here, if you run into an uh, uh, unfortunate situation where you have financial difficulties, your tutor is a person you would go and speak to. And they'll be able to advise and guide you through the various types of bursary schemes which are available in the university to support students through hardship, financial hardship. Other things what a tutor can do if you have any kind of family bereavement whilst you're at university or any kind of health conditions while you're at university, which has an adverse effect on your academic studies and your performance. Your tutor is there to advise and help and support you through that and to make sure that your director of studies and your department are taking that into consideration when evaluating your performance at, in exams or assessments. So as well as that, within the college, there's always a college nurse there. And again, they're there for support, for pastoral care and for medical support as well for any students. Now, every college will have a chapel and have a chaplain as well. And again, they're there to provide some counsel and advice for students. Now, hopefully when we go on to the student talk, Lamona will tell you a little bit about how her experience were, you know, were sort of um, having the chaplain and the chapel available in college. Um, apart from all of this, the college also provides a lot of support for the undergraduate teaching. And what typically happens at Cambridge is there's lots of small group teachings that take place within the college. They're known as supervisions. And basically in the supervision, what happens, depending on the subject, you either have a one-to-one -one supervision or you may be in a group of two or three students who get together and go through the material that has been taught to them in the lecture courses. So typically what would happen is you would go to your lectures during the morning, you would probably have some time in the afternoon where you are having some practical classes or some assessments running at the same time. Or and then in the evenings, you would have an opportunity to have some downtime with some friends. But also there would be some supervisions which are running in the afternoons and evenings, which will go over core material that you've covered in the lectures to make sure you've understood it properly. And those supervisions are organized within the college. So that's hopefully gives you a broad idea of what a department does and their role and how the college works in conjunction with that. A little bit about the application process. And there's a number of stages involved in preparing your application to the University of Cambridge. The first thing I always advise students is to really think about the course that they're applying for. Now I know everyone's here because they're interested in history, but 
when you are looking into the subject you want to choose at university, please do spend some time, research it properly. So to give you some, uh, some sort of um, inf more broader information around that, the university offers over 31 different courses. And those courses cover over 65 different subject areas. So do your research, think about what's really interests you, what you want to, to pursue as an academic subject at university before preparing your application to apply for a course. Once you've chosen your course, and I, I presume everyone here will want to be doing history, um, then you need to think about which college you want to apply to. Now, a lot of applicants have a clear idea about which college they would want to go to. However, if you're not sure, please do make a, the, uh, um, a, uh, use the opportunity to come and visit university. I mean, I know right now we are in a phase where there's a lockdown and there isn't an opportunity to do that. If there was in July next week, we would be running a series of open days where students could come and visit all the colleges. But there is a virtual open day, which has been organized by the university, which will be uh, launched later this week. And there will be lots of information available on the university website about that. And if you go to the virtual open day website link, you'll be able to find lots of information about virtual tools, about different colleges and different departments. So do please make good use of that. Um, so when choosing a college, it's important that you research that because you're going to spend three years or four years of your life at that college studying. So you need to make sure it's somewhere you're going to enjoy living and where you're going to be comfortable living there. Now, a number of students have a, a very range of different list of criteria that they would like the college to, to, to um, fulfill for them. So I always advise students, have your own criteria list. You, know, you may want to choose a college because of its location. You may want to choose a college because it's quite close to the department you want to study. You may choose a college because it has very good accommodation facilities. You may pick a college because it's got very good sports facilities. That's entirely your choice, but have your own criteria list and use that to guide you through your choice of college. Um, hopefully today we'll tell you a little bit more about Downing and hopefully that would interest you as well. But at the same time, if you're not too sure about the college you want to apply to and you don't want to have the hassle of choosing a college, you can always put an open application in. And if you choose to put an open application in, all that will happen is once the university receives your application, they will be relocating you to a particular college. Either way is absolutely fine and it has no impact on your application. Both are absolutely fine. So it's entirely your choice. Once you've made, chosen your college, you need to then realize about some of the deadlines for applications. Now, for history, you don't have to worry about any pre-admissions assessment deadlines, registrations, but if you were doing another course, if it had a pre-admissions test, you would need to make sure that you register for that in, in a timely manner before the deadline passes. Also, you need to think about the UCAS application deadline. This is much earlier compared to other universities and it's around, it's on the 15th of October. So please make sure that you prepare your application well in advance to be able to get it submitted by the 15th of October. Now, once you've submitted your application and, and the university has received it, you will then receive uh, an email from the university asking you to fill out a supplementary questionnaire. Now, this is nothing to worry about. All the university is doing once they are asking you to fill out this SAQ is so they can gather some more information about you, which is not provided in the UCAS application. Now, to give you an example of the type of information that we would ask in the SAQ, we would ask you what kind of, what kind of subjects you've covered so far in your A-level courses. And all that does is allows your interviewer, if you do get invited for an interview, an opportunity to go through what you've already covered so far at school and base their questions in an interview around what previous knowledge you already have. So those are what the SAQ is there. It's just us trying to gather more information about the applicant. There's nothing to worry about. Just please fill it out and submit it as part of your application. Again, if you're not sure about anything, get in touch with the college where your application has been received they should be able to help and advise you and guide you through that. Now, point number six is something which is quite valid for history. It's important for history. As part of your application for history, you will be asked to submit some written work. And once your application has been received and reviewed by the college, they will get in touch with you to provide you further information about the type of written work they would want and what they, they would need this written work submitted by. 
And now once we've received all this information, we will then be looking through these applications and then be making a decision about which one of those are the applicants which have applied to us, we would like to invite for an interview. And usually by the end of November, the, the invitations go out for interviews and candidates are normally interviewed early December for, for the admissions process. And I'll be telling a little bit about what happens in the typical interview. And after we've interviewed the candidates, we then review all the candidates, how they performed in the interviews, all of their other information, such as their academic track record so far, their personal statements, their school references, and the written work they've submitted, to then make a decision about who we'd like to select to make an offer to. And our decisions usually go out in early January. So hopefully that gives you a broad overview of the application process and the stages involved in that. Now, what information do we use to assess your application? Now, I can't emphasize this enough. We don't just use one particular bit of information and, and that takes more precedent than other. We actually look at all the information which is provided to us and we take that all into consideration. So things like your academic track record, your personal statement, your teacher's reference, any written work you submit in the case for history, any extenuating circumstances. So as part of the supplementary questionnaire, there's an opportunity for students to talk about any kind of extenuating circumstances which has had an impact on their work. It could be a family bereavement, it could be health issues which have had an impact on your academic work so far. So we want to hear about that so we can take that into consideration. And obviously we look at the interview scores and the interview reports. And what we do is we take all this information together in combination to make a decision about whether we would like to consider an application for an offer. Not one individual item here, individual criteria here, is considered in isolation. It's all considered together. The whole process is looked at as a holistic process. So I can't emphasize that enough. We look at all of this information when we're reviewing applications. What are we looking for? Now, this is something which I have to say, tell all applicants, and I can't emphasize this enough. We are looking for academic ability and potential. We're looking for students who are capable and being able to keep up with the course content taught at Cambridge, meet the subject requirements, but also have a real genuine interest in the subject. We want to make sure the applicants which are selected are the ones which are capable of keeping up with the course content and getting through the degree. It's quite a challenging environment in Cambridge. The workload is quite hard and fast. So we need to make sure candidates can keep with that, up with that. So we are purely focusing on looking on academic ability and potential and suitability of the to, to, to the candidate to the course. If you are playing for the under 18 England's football squad, which is fantastic, we would, we would definitely encourage people to pursue their interests, but that will not form part of our decision process when we are looking at applications. So things like extracurricular activities, your background, your school is irrelevant. We are purely interested on academic ability and content about your application. So standard conditional offers for history and for typically for many art subjects is an A star and two A's. If you're doing your A levels and if you're doing IB, you need to score between 40 to 42 with a 776 in the higher level subjects. And lots more information is available on the university website and on the college website about the entry requirements for candidates. So please feel free to look through those. But if there's anything you're not sure about, please do get in touch with the college that you're applying to and, and, and the admissions office and the admissions team will be able to help and advise you through that. Now a little bit about personal statements. Um, it's really important that you spend some time writing your personal statement. This is really your opportunity to present yourself as an individual to the, the, the university in your application. So please do spend some time putting your, application, your personal statement together. They typically are between four to uh, five to six hundred words long, and they should be mainly about your academic content, two thirds, and one third possibly about your personal interests. The things we're looking for when we're reading through a personal statement is academic ability and potential, motivation and suitability to the course, and commitment and self-discipline. We want to be able to see the main thing we're looking for when we're when we're reviewing applications: are the candidates able to work independently? Can they, can they go through 
their learning process independently? Are they able to think through problems, work through them on their own? So those sorts of things, commitment and self-discipline, motivation, academic ability and potential are things we are looking for. And if there's ways of you reflecting that in your personal statement, that would be great. Now some advice on how to do that. What I would always advise candidates is to spend some time looking at some supercurricular activities. So do read around your subject, you know, if you're interested in, in history, you know, there are lots of resources available online, Radio 4, BBC Radio 4, TED Talks, lots of interesting literature out there. Read around your subject. What we're looking for is people to be able to take what they're learning at school and then apply it in context to what's available in, in the world today, you know, information which is available here today. So do, do take advantage of all the resources available online. And there's lots more information about this on the university websites. So please do look through that and do actually make, take advantage of these opportunities to read around your subject and build a broader context knowledge around your subject area. Now, a successful personal statement. I mean, just to kind of emphasize this, we're looking for specific evidence and examples of areas of interest and achievement. So if you have uh, had some experience of working somewhere or have read, read a piece of literature which has had a significant impact on you, you can talk about that experience and talk about how that has led to your decision about wanting to study the subject you want to pursue at university. You, know, you need to show you have thought about the re and researched the course beyond your school curriculum. And, and you, know, you really need to be able to emphasize what is it that is interesting you about that subject and how you've come to that decision. Now, a lot of applicants, when they put their personal statements, list out all the references of all the different types of literature they've read around the subject. That's absolutely great. And that's fantastic if someone shows that they have read around their subject. But what would be more useful is if you picked out one or two of the references that you've read about and talk about what was it that interested you about that, that's those, those particular bits of literature. How did that have an impact on you? And how does that lead to your decision to pursue the degree you want to do at university? So hopefully that gives you an idea about the sort of things to focus on when you're putting your personal statements together. Now, moving on to the interview. So if you are successfully, if you are selected and invited for an interview, typically what would happen is you would have two interviews on the same day. Um, the interviews are around 20 to 30 minutes long. And at every, at each interview, there'll be two academics there who will be interviewing you. Um, usually um, the interviews are always based around the, the, the academic work and the academic discussion. So at an interview, you may be asked to look at a piece of literature uh, and be able to comment on it and be able to discuss it and, and put some uh, arguments across about it. Or you may, the, 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 the interviewer may look through your personal statement and pick up something that you've talked about and go into a detailed discussion about that. The key thing we're looking for in an interview is a candidate's ability to think through a discussion and present their arguments clearly. There is no, we're not looking for people who can get to the answer as quickly as possible. What we're more interested in is the thought process you take through your discussion and getting to the, 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 uh, the, the answer to the question that's been presented to you. What we're looking for is how teachable you are. So the interview, the best thing to do is to think about it as like a supervision session, a learning session, a discussion, where some people are trying to present some ideas to you, have a discussion with you and see how you work through the discussion or the problem and through the information that's provided to you. So I've just kind of touched on this, you know, what's expected in recent academic work, wider reading and, and your work experience, visible issues related to the subject in the world, wider world. These are some of the main core areas that may be touched on in an interview. All right. So just moving on and at the end of my talk now, frequently asked questions. So there's lots of questions that candidates normally ask and just wanted to highlight some of these. Key thing is a lot of people do ask about, is it possible to have a gap year? And that's not a problem at all. If you are thinking of taking a gap year after A-levels, you can apply to the university and ask for deferred entry. That's absolutely possible. I mean, this doesn't apply to you, this comment here about maths, but if you were doing maths, there would be some specifics, uh, um, some impact on whether you take a gap year or not. 
Other things, extenuating circumstances. I just really wanted to emphasize this. Just do, do, do take an opportunity to, to consider this. If there has been any uh, issues or problems which has disrupted your, your schoolwork and has an impact on your academic work, please do let the university know because we want to know about this when we are considering your application. We would like to take that into consideration. So um, this is the end of my talk. I will hand over to uh, Dr. David Pratt, who will tell you a little bit, bit more about the course and history in general. And please do continue posting questions and we look forward to answering them later on. Well, thank you, uh, Cameron. Um, and I should introduce myself. I'm David Pratt. I'm Director of Studies in History here at Downing. I work on the Anglo-Saxon period of British history. That's the period before the Norman Conquest. I published a book some years ago on King Alfred, and I also teach the history of political ideas. So I have some fairly wide-ranging wide interests. I'm going to be addressing really three questions that it seems that you all will um, be thinking about. Um, the first is, why might I want to study history at university? Um, and I should stress that this is the, the most important question because you're going to be spending three years studying your subject. You want to get your subject choice right. Second question is, why might I want to study history at Cambridge? And the third question is, why might I want to study history at Downing? Uh, and I should say that in some ways that's actually the least important question. There are 24 colleges within the university. Um, and you have the additional luxury of choosing a college. The course is the same, whichever, whichever college um, you attend. So the first question, why might I want to study history at university? Well, I would observe that history is one of a number of arts and humanities subjects, and there are quite close relationships between history, English literature, modern languages, economics, geography, um, sociology, uh, politics, and you are probably studying a number of these other subjects uh, as well. And these are all subjects uh, which are interested in human societies and their development, they're interested in ideas and in language and in texts. And it can sometimes be difficult to decide uh, which of these various subjects um, you are most interested in. What I can say is that history does have a, a distinctive identity as a subject. Um, it is interested in lived experience, uh, the experience of actual people in the past rather than fictional ones. Um, and a, an important historical skill is an ability to imagine the experiences of others in the past, what is often called empathy. It's also interested in human society using a particular dimension, time, and it's no coincidence that historians are particularly interested in change and in, in assessing the causes of change over time. Historians also have a distinctive set of skills which they use to explore the past. The notion of a primary source, for example, is a, a fundamental one, uh, and historians use the sources to reconstruct and understand uh, past societies and past experiences. It might be worth asking yourself, are, are these the sorts of features of history that grab you as a subject and that interest you? And hopefully um, the answer is yes. Uh, and I can say a little bit more about the practicalities of studying history at university. History at university does typically revolve around essay writing. Um, students within Cambridge would typically write an essay a week uh, within term time. And it's important for me to stress that um, there are good reasons for this. An essay is a persuasive piece of writing, uh, giving an answer to a particular problem or question. Um, an essay will be putting forward a set of hopefully convincing arguments and will be making use of um, uh, the work of other historians and of primary sources in order to do that. Um, it, it encourages a form of public argument, as it were, and would allow you to engage with the available uh, material on a particular subject. Um, 
And it's no coincidence that um, professional historians, when they're writing up they, their research, they would typically uh, write articles in journals and they would be using many of the techniques um, in essay writing in order to uh, present uh, their view as persuasive and uh, convincing. Essay writing, in addition, uh, provides many transferable skills, um, the ability to argue, to communicate clearly, to uh, construct a valid and uh, logically uh, organised argument, to offer examples. These are uh, very broad skills which can be used for a variety of purposes. One other way in which history at university is different from school is um, the role of lectures. Uh, lectures are typically last about 15 minutes. Uh, they offer an overview of a subject given by an expert in the field. Uh, and they are themselves a kind of uh, performance. They are typically um, uh, offering arguments that could be used within essays um, and uh, will hopefully be persuasive and convincing. Um, Lectures are not there fundamentally to transmit knowledge, but rather to inspire, to give an overview of the subject, to present some kind of landscape of the subject and to uh, indicate uh, how, what might be the necessary reading um, to um, develop an overall understanding. Let me move on to the second question, which is why might I want to study history in Cambridge? Well, I should say that um, this is an important question. I don't think you should be assuming, well, I'd like to go and study at Cambridge and history is my best subject, so history at Cambridge is, is, is obviously the best course for me. I think it's important that you do research on all of the courses that you are considering. They do vary a little from university to university. What I can tell you about is some of the advantages and strengths of the uh, uh, teaching of history within Cambridge. And the first of these is simply the scale of resources available within Cambridge. We have world-class libraries. Um, uh, we have the University Library, which has a copy of every book published in the UK since 18, the 1830s. Um, we have the kind of research facilities that attract a very wide range of teachers in history um, to Cambridge. And we have well over a hundred um, teachers of history and their profiles are listed on the faculty website. Um, we're able to cover a vast range of uh, areas of history from ancient to medieval to the modern periods and covering many parts of the globe. Um, and it's that uh, range of expertise um, uh, and the availability of these teachers to teach undergraduates that is a particular strength. I should say something also about the supervision system. Um, supervisions are a one hour um, session with an expert in a field. Um, typically in history, they revolve around the discussion of an essay, um, which will have been written in advance by the student uh, and uh, uh, that would then broaden into a wider discussion of the topic. Typically, uh, within history in Cambridge, our supervisions are on a one-to-one -one basis and offer uh, bespoke and tailored feedback of a kind which isn't really available anywhere else. The other strength of the Cambridge degree is the very wide range of choice within um, the degree. Um, have a look on the History Faculty website for an overview, but you will see that history is divided into part one, which lasts two years, and then two, part two, which lasts the final year. Typically in the first year, students would study a mixture of papers in British history and also European history. There is a very wide range of choice um, within these British and European papers, again, ancient, medieval, modern history and both political history and social economic history is also available. Typically in the first year you would end up studying a period of around 150 to 200 years for each of these papers, perhaps a bit longer for the medieval and ancient periods, but you would be studying topics um, intensively but also briefly. Um, so one week one might be studying the French Revolution the next week moving on to Napoleon. This is important because um, we think it's important that um, history students develop an overview of broader periods and are able to immerse themselves in those periods. These are the kind of building blocks 
of the subject. In the second year, uh, other options become available, such as the history of political thought, um, American history and world history. It is also possible to study uh, more British or European history in the second year. Moving on to part two, which lasts the final year, this is characterised by a greater degree of specialisation. Um, much revolves around the special subject, um, which is uh, an area um, uh, of particular interest to lecturers within the faculty. There is a very wide range of specified special subjects available in any given year. Um, the special subject is typically taught using mainly primary source material. And in part two, you move essentially to becoming a fully trained historian um, uh, making use of primary sources. In part two, there are also what are known as specified subjects. These are also relatively specialised papers, um, often having a comparative angle and also making use of primary source material. It's also possible to do an optional dissertation of uh, 12,000 words, um, and this can be on any subject falling within the subject of history, uh, and it makes use of primary source material. There is great freedom in writing a part two dissertation, and for many of our students, it's a highlight of their training and their experiences within the degree. One other element within part two is historical argument and practice, which is a methodology paper. It asks the big questions within history. Um, uh, you know, is class still a useful category of analysis? Um, uh, is there any validity in the Marxist interpretation of history? Uh, and we take historical argument and practice particularly seriously within the college, and we offer regular seminars on that subject. Just finally, my question, why might I want to apply to Downing to study history? Well, as I've said, you have the additional luxury of choosing a college. What I can, can say is that Downing is neither an ancient college nor a modern college, but falls somewhere interestingly in the middle, uh, founded in 1800. It combines some of the pomp and circumstance of an older college um, with the modern facilities and open space of a modern college. History is one of a number of uh, medium-sized art subjects within the college, English literature, classics, modern languages, geography, economics, um, and there is a healthy um, subject community in art subjects in the college. Um, typically, we would uh, have around six or seven historians in every year group, but there are no subject quotas within the college, and this will vary from year to year. If you look across the university, you will find some colleges with larger numbers of students, others with smaller numbers of students. And it's really a matter of personal taste whether you wish to be part of a larger herd of students or perhaps part of a smaller but uh, more focused subject community. Uh, our, our students are a, 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 a tightly uh, knit community. We have a history society within the college, the Maitland Historical Society, and as I've said, we have regular seminars on historical argument and practice, um, which are taught uh, by your group and are a further way of um, uh, forming strong subject community uh, within the college. Turning to the admissions process, I'd want to echo everything that Dr Eunice has said about our being interested in all of the information that we have about applicants. So not just your educational record to date, um, but your personal statement, references written for you, written work which you've submitted, and of course the interviews themselves. And I'd want to stress that we have two interviews. One, a subject-based interview, which would typically be with myself and uh, my colleague, Dr. Natalia mora -Seacher. Um, That interview would uh, initially involve discussion of the written work which you had submitted in advance and would then broaden into a wider discussion of um, your uh, intentions to study history uh, at, at Downing. And a second interview, which would be a general academic interview um, asking uh, uh, broader questions about your other A-level subjects, your wider historical interests, and also, again, picking up on um, uh, areas of interest identified within your personal statement. My best advice to applicants would be to read 
broadly and widely around the subject of history in preparation for university study. Wherever you end up studying history, there will be a wide range of choice um, and you need to have sampled areas of history outside your A-level um, in order to make an informed choice um, of your papers. So ask your teachers for advice um, to read about other subjects and other periods outside your, your courses. Um, have a look at the BBC History magazine or History Today, both of which provide useful starting points for um, getting into other subjects and periods and often have useful advice on reading. Um, and ask yourself, why do you personally want to spend three years um, studying history? Uh, what is your agenda um, in seeking to take advantage of what is uh, 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 an extremely um, invigorating and broadly based um, history uh, course. So I'll end there and I'll move on to one of our current students, um, Lamorna Reed, who will be saying something about the student perspective uh, on studying history. Thank you for that. Um, so as Dr. Pratt said, uh, my name is Lamorna and I'm a first year studying history at Downing, but well, I've just finished my first year. Um, and so I have prepared a presentation on uh, student life, uh, studying history at Downing, um, but also things like societies and um, the social life at Downing. Um, so firstly, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, my first impressions of Cambridge. Um, I know from experience that uh, the application process can sometimes feel quite daunting um, and even though I was fortunate enough to be able to attend a physical open day, um, I think by the end of year 12 I still wasn't entirely sure about my subject, uh, whether I even wanted to apply to Cambridge. Um, I think I worried that I wouldn't fit in, um, that everyone there would be different to me uh, coming from a comprehensive school in Cornwall um, but I'm so glad I applied because that hasn't been my experience at all. Um, I've met so many great people, um, people who are different to me um, but who are more interesting for the fact that they've had different life experiences. Um, I found that Downing has been such a warm community um, and I just really love the whole environment. Um, the middle picture is um, looking down towards the paddock at Downing um, and that's really nice. It's a big open green space. You can walk on the grass, you can um, play sport there, have picnics in summer, things like that. Um, and then just living in Cambridge in general, it's such a beautiful and historic city uh, to live in. Uh, so, your first experience, if you were to study uh, at Downing, would be Freshers' Week, which is organised by um, the second year Freshers' Reps. Um, so, the main two things of Freshers' Week at Downing um, are matriculation and the college family scheme. Um, so, the college family is a, a thing that happens across Cambridge. Um, you are assigned two college parents in the year above you, uh, one of whom will do your subject, and then you have two or three, um, well, one or two um, college siblings. And on family day, um, you meet your college parents, um, they generally take you punting, um, you just spend the day together. Um, and generally, um, in the first few weeks, even beyond that uh, your college parents are just a uh, really useful slightly informal support network um, they've been through it the year before um, and minded things like they left chocolate in my pigeonhole in week five uh, which is the week uh, where people supposedly start missing home um, and then the other thing is matriculation so um, these photographs are from my matriculation and that's basically just a fancy word for formally entering the University of Cambridge. Um, you just have to read a declaration, it's a few lines long, 
um, but you get to dress up for the day and um, wear your gown and for the celebration in the evening. Um, so you will have drinks with your director of studies, who is the academic responsible for your subject. Um, and then you have a formal dinner uh, where the master makes a short speech. So uh, naturally, one of the uh, most significant parts of student life at Cambridge is studying. Um, the history teaching is done through lectures, which happen at the Cedric site, uh, which is about a 20 minute walk from Downing, and also through supervisions. Um, and as has been mentioned, um, these are, they tend to be one-on-one, -on -one, occasionally uh, two-on-one um, for history. Um, and you have them with a Cambridge academic and uh, you generally will discuss an essay that you've written that week um, and then just the broader um, topic around the essay. And this time I've been doing uh, paper five, which is 19th century British political history. Um, so I've looked at things like um, the 1832 Reform Act, Chartism, and the extent to which women participated in politics in that period. Um, and this year I also did papers 10 and 17, um, which is British social and economic history, kind of 18th, 19th centuries, um, and European history in the same period. Um, and they are very broad papers, um, but they do give you a really great foundation of uh, historical knowledge. Um, and you have quite a lot of choice as to what topics you can do in those papers. So supervisions are probably one of the defining characteristics um, of Cambridge. Um, they're part of what makes Oxford unique. Uh, they are quite often tailored to you. So um, some supervisors I've had centered the whole um, hour long discussion around questions you have, things you might have not understood, um, concepts you've struggled with a bit. Um, and it's just quite cool to be uh, supervised by historians who are uh, leaders in their field of study. Um, however, we are sometimes taught in small groups. Um, so Dr. Pratt mentioned historical argument and practice. Um, so that is taught with the other historians at your college. Um, we have two HAB classes at Downing Term um, run by Dr. Pratt and um, we um, we've done Marxist history, um, cultural history, uh, Foucault, things like that. Um, it's kind of concerned with how we do history. Um, and we also have regular contact with our director of studies. And we have uh, meetings with him at the start and end of each term. Um, and as Dr. Pratt mentioned, um, there is also the Maitland Society. Um, so all Downing historians are part of that and twice a term uh, we listen to a guest speaker lecture on a historical topic um, and then we have a formal dinner afterwards. Um, so for history we have uh, about 10 to 12 contact hours a week uh, which means that we have a relatively free timetable um, so that means you're responsible for how much independent study you do. I would normally do around 20, maybe 25 hours of independent work a week. Um, and that's basically reading secondary literature. So you get a reading list from your supervisor each week um, and writing a weekly essay. Um, so Downing Library has um, quite a lot of the books that I need um, and it's open 24 seven. Um, but if it doesn't, there are uh, currently 148 other libraries in Cambridge. Um, there's the Seeley Library, which is the History Library, and the University Library, and they're both located at the Sidgwick site, um, which is the Humanities site. And um, you can study in these libraries, um, but I, I sometimes go to Downing Library, but I quite like studying in the Butterfield Cafe. Uh, which is a cafe inside the grounds of Downing and um, it's open to the public um, so I quite like working with the background noise. The next thing to talk about is accommodation. Um, so in my opinion one of the really great things about Downing is the amazing first year accommodation. 
Um, most of the first rooms have on suites, uh, some have double beds, and they're all really, really big rooms. Um, the other good thing is that um, throughout your time, uh, there are no hidden accommodation charges. So um, things like laundry and bills and Wi-Fi is all included in that. Um, and all the first years are accommodated together. Uh, so that makes it easier to get to know people in the first few days or weeks. Um, there's also a really strong sense of community. And I think uh, this is partly because of the fact that um, all the downing accommodation is on site. Um, which is really great because it means that when you want to go to the bar or the library um, or the cafe, then you don't have to walk very far. It's about five minutes, maybe from end to end. Um, and then in terms of catering, so all the accommodation has kitchen facilities um, that you'll share with maybe six or seven other people um, so you can cook for yourself. Um, but you can also choose to eat in the dining hall, which is what we call stops. Um, and most people tend to do a bit of both. Um, also, our rooms get cleaned every weekday by the lovely housekeeping team. And um, the porters are on hand if you ever have any um, accommodation related problems, things like locking yourself out, uh, which everyone does at least once. And um, yeah, they'll, they'll just be happy to help you um, anytime, day or night. Um, it's also worth briefly mentioning that um, we have an accommodation ballot in Second Idea. So um, you enter the ballot, um, you can enter individually or in a group of up to six. And um, the result is completely random, but it gets flipped in your third year. So if you come top of the ballot in second year, then you'll be bottom in third year. Um, and that means you choose your room last. Um, some colleges do it differently, some of them have an academic ballot, so your position and ballot is determined by your results, um, but that's how Downing does them. Um, so moving on to societies, there are plenty of sporting opportunities to get involved in Downing um, with varying degrees of competitiveness. So for example, I play netball at college um, and we're part of a kind of friendly league with um, other Cambridge colleges and um, we have matches about every weekend um, but they're very relaxed and there's not really any kind of pressure um, but other sports things like um, rowing and rugby um, are a bit more competitive um, and downing does very well on them. Um, rowing also has a really strong social aspect so uh, they have things like boat club dinners and um, I rode in first time, and I would really recommend trying it. Um, most people haven't done it before, um, and I think it's just a, a really great way of meeting people. Um, and then at a university level, uh, there are loads and loads of sporting societies, um, more than I could possibly name. Uh, they have sort of anything, uh, sailing, taekwondo, polo, climbing, and things like that. Um, but you can find a full list on the Cambridge University Student Union's website. Um, I think the, just the general thing to say is that um, university is such a good opportunity to try new things. Um, the best advice that I had was to sign up to as many things as interest you um, and then from there you can figure out what you enjoy and what you want to stick at. So apart from sport, um, Downing and Cambridge in general have lots of other societies on offer. Um, there's something for everyone really. Um, so the drama scene at Downing is uh, particularly strong. Uh, we have our own theatre, the Howard Theatre, and there are things like the uh, annual Freshers Day, which is uh, directed by an action by Freshers. And there's also the Festival of New Writing, uh, aside from that, there is the choir who sing in uh, chapel services at Downing and there's also a Downing Jazz Band. Um, on a university level, I'm involved with um, Cambridge University Amnesty International Society and I'm a member of the Cambridge Union, which you may or may not have heard of, um, but it is a debating chamber, so it holds debates on um, current affairs, things like um, Extinction Rebellion and Brexit um, and they have 
guest speakers. So uh, last year they had Bill Gates um, and they also had Frankie Moon. Um, and again, as with sport, there is a full list of all the Cambridge societies on the QC website. So the nature of the collegiate system at Cambridge means that uh, quite a lot of your social life does revolve around your college. Um, personally, I think that's one of the real advantages of studying at Cambridge. Um, as far as I can tell, all of the colleges are really tight-knit, supportive communities. Um, and at Downing, one of our highlights of the week is Keith's Cafe. So Keith is our chaplain and every uh, Thursday afternoon he serves free donuts and free tea and coffee on the chapel steps. And this uh, draws a whole mixture of Downing students. Um, and for most people, it's just quite a nice break in their working day. Um, it's a very good excuse for procrastination. Um, and the chapel also hosts things like uh, Even Song every Sunday um, and Compline, which happens twice a term. And uh, that's just evening prayer. Um, so the social centre of Downing is Downing Bar. Um, this doubles up as the Butterfield Cafe during the day, um, but the bars open every evening and it's the venue for things like the pub quiz, which happens on a Monday, and um, also for live music. Um, so Downing Jazz Band play there um, about once a town. Um, and the other thing to say about social life at Downing is we have things called EMPs um, and they're parties that are held in college, they're often in the bar um, and they're organised by the JCR EMPs officers who are elected every year. Um, however, by no means is social life restricted to just Downing. Um, there is so much to do in Cambridge itself and I uh, quite like getting away from college sometimes um, because it can uh, fill a little bit of a bubble. Um, so Downing is located on a street with uh, lots of restaurants, so going out for dinner is really easy. Um, we're also very close to the shops, um, very close to Sainsbury's, um, about a five minute walk from the centre of town. Um, there are also several clubs nearby um, and uh, in Cambridge there's the ADC Theatre, so that's where uh, Cambridge Footlights perform and um, they run student productions all year. Um, which you can act in or you can go and watch. Um, we also have uh, museums like the Fitzwilliam Museum um, and art galleries like Curtis Yard uh, that you can go to. And Downing has its own art gallery, which is uh, called the Hyong Gallery. Uh, another thing you can do is visit other colleges. So uh, you can do things like look inside King's Chapel or walk to Girton which is the Cambridge College that's the furthest out from the centre. Um, and also Winter Wonderland comes to Cambridge uh, at Christmas and uh, comes to Parker's Peace, which is the park opposite Downing. Um, so we uh, went ice skating there uh, at Christmas, which was very fun. So moving on to formals. Um, formals are a pretty iconic part of the Cambridge experience. Uh, they happen at Downing three times a week, Wednesday, Friday and Sunday. Um, they happen at other colleges more or less frequently. Um, and they take place in our dining hall um, and they consist of a three course meal. Um, they're very atmospheric. Um, they are candlelit. You dress up in formal clothes, you wear your gown. Um, and if the master is dining, we have to say grace before we eat. Um, however, that element of tradition is balanced out by um, the fact that forms are a lot of fun um, people sometimes go for their birthdays, um, I did for mine this year um, and at the end of the day you're just sort of having dinner with your friends. Um, there are also special forms, so things like uh, Halloween for the formal where you dress up and you don't have to wear a gown. Um, there's also Chinese New Year and um, Bridgemas, which is the Cambridge celebration of Christmas. Um, and a formal ticket tends to be around £10, um, but it can differ slightly. So having mentioned Bridgemas, um, Bridgemas is a Cambridge tradition you will encounter if you um, study at Cambridge in your first term. 
Um, so most people aren't at Downing over Christmas. So instead we celebrate it on the 25th of November. Um, generally each accommodation block or staircase will um, cook a roast dinner. And um, the picture on the right is um, ours in Kenny A, which is uh, the accommodation I lived in this year. Um, and we all got our bedside tables down um, and we put them in the foyer and we put them together um, to make a big table that we could eat off. Um, and that was a really nice bonding experience with the people I live with. Um, there's also Bridge Must Formal, which is the picture on the left. Um, and that happens in the last week of first time. Um, and a big Christmas tree goes up in the dining hall and the choir come and sing carols. Uh, so the final thing I want to talk about is uh, work-life balance. Um, Cambridge is an intensely academic environment and I think this makes work-life balance so important. Um, I would say that the workload is probably the thing that I found the hardest. Um, you have to be prepared to work hard, um, you have deadlines that are very close together, um, but it's also vital that you take care of your mental health and that you know when you need a break. Um, so one of the ways of doing that is by taking advantage of the extracurricular activities on offer. Um, but as has been mentioned, we also have uh, several support systems available. Um, so things like the tutor system, everyone has a personal tutor who they meet with at the start and end of each term. And uh, you can go and see them whenever if you're having any issues. Um, there's also our chaplain, Keith, He's very approachable um, and you can talk to him if you're worried about something. Um, there's your DOS, um, there's also the university counselling service or the college nurse for um, any more serious mental health concerns. Um, so that is the end of my presentation um, and just to sum up I would say that um, Although I have found studying history at Cambridge quite challenging, um, it's also been so enriching. Um, it's an incredibly intellectually stimulating environment. Um, it's an opportunity to discuss historical concepts with world leading academics, um, but also with really interesting, engaging students. Um, and I think that combined with the traditions and the societies um, and the colleges uh, just make it an experience that you can't really get anywhere else. Thank you so much, um, Lamorna and David and Cameron for all your um, talks. I really hope that was helpful for everybody. Um, I definitely found it very insightful. Um, you should see on the Q&A um, box, we've answered lots of your questions as we've been going along, um, but we'll answer a few live now that we haven't got to um, yet. So please do send in your questions if you've got any more that you'd like to ask any of the speakers. Uh, so Cam, I'll start with you. Um, since the students can only write one personal statement for UCAS, um, how do they make sure that their personal statement covers Cambridge and other universities and how different is our requirements uh, for the personal statement than other universities? I'm glad someone asked that question. It's something I was uh, supposed to mention uh, as part of my talk. Um, one of the things that a lot of applicants do have come across is that they want to be able to write the particular personal statement for their application to Cambridge, especially if they're applying for a course which is not an offer at other universities. Um, in that scenario, my advice to students is that they should take the opportunity in the SAQ questionnaire that gets sent out. There is a section in there which allows students to write a personal statement that they want to put together particularly for their application at Cambridge. Um, if you are thinking of applying to history and you're thinking of applying to history to a number of universities, your personal statement that you write for, for UCAS should be okay, it should be good enough for all your applications to different universities. However, if you wanted to put one particularly together just for your application to Cambridge, there is an opportunity for you to do that in the SAQ. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Lamorna, I've got a question um, for you. Um, what A-levels uh, did you study, if you're happy to share that, and um, how did you prepare for your history degree? Um, so I did history, obviously, um, English literature and French. Um, 
And how did I prepare? As in for the interview or just for studying history, history generally? Uh, they just said for your history degree. Okay. Um, well, I suppose I read a fair amount um, around the kind of history of interview uh, that interested me. Um, so things like uh, social history, people's history of um, uh, topics like the Cold War, uh, things like that. Great. And what about your interview then? Um, so for my interview, I, uh, I had a couple of mock interviews at school. Um, but I think the thing that you find when you have the real interview is that it's actually quite often not like that. Um, you can't really prepare for the questions. Um, so I think the best thing to do is to just practice uh, talking about history, talking about the bits of history that interest you, um, kind of practicing maybe debating with people a bit, um, because generally the interview panels are looking for people who can kind of argue a case or um, be receptive to other people's ideas. Um, and as Dr. Pratt mentioned, I also did things like I looked at BBC History magazines. Is there anything you want to add on top of that, Cam? Yeah, I was just going to say um, one of my advice for, for interviews is, is, I mean, it's very hard to stay calm, but I mean, just my advice is to stay calm, you know, and, and the key thing is in an interview, what we're looking for is your thought process. So think out loud, you know, if you're talking through a concept or working through an idea, you know, we want to know how you're thinking through that problem, how you're making that journey to coming up with your arguments or your discussion about a, about a particular topic or question. So think out loud. And more importantly, ask questions if you're not too sure about something. You know, if you've been presented with a question and you're unsure about what's been asked of you, do ask for clarification. And one other thing I always tell interviewers, in the candidates who have been interviewed, uh, you're going to have two interviews on the day. Um, you'll have one and then a break and then you'll have your second interview. Don't let, if you've had your first interview and you've walked out and you felt that it hasn't gone well, don't let that have an impact on how you perform on your second interview. Nine out of 10 times if a candidate walks out and they felt that they've had a really hard time in the interview, it's most likely because they've had a very good interview because the interview has asked them a question, they've articulated it well, presented an argument, and they've gone into more of a discussion. So they've asked more and more and more and more questions. And that means that the candidate feels more under pressure and is trying to think through more of what's been presented to them. And sometimes candidates come out thinking, God, I, I really, that was really hard. That was really difficult. But don't let that put you off because that probably meant that you had a very good interview. So that's my advice to candidates. Stay calm. Ask questions if you're not sure about anything. Reset after your first interview before you work into your second one. One last thing is look at the university resources available. There's lots of YouTube videos that universities put together about the interview process. Do, do visit the university YouTube channel and look at those. They do actually provide a, a really good representation of what actually happens at the interview. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, coming back to you again, Cam, um, do we have any bursaries slash scholarships um, at Downing? So um, the, all, all colleges offer bursaries and scholarships and hardship funds for students. Um, at Downing, we, we offer, we have what is known as a hardship fund, which provides students with emergency funding for, uh, for financial needs if they run out of money, and that can be up to £500 a term. Um, we also offer um, bursaries for books, uh, for uh, bursaries for travel, if they need to travel for their for studies and so forth. And there are some other hardship funds which the university offers, which the college has access to. And again, this is where the tutor's role really comes into play, where they offer the support and advice to students and will be able to look into what, what bursaries and for, uh, for funding schemes the student can apply for. Thank you. Um, we've got a question about EPQs. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, whether a student should do an EPQ or not? So if, the, if their school is offering them an EPQ and they have an opportunity to do it, I definitely would encourage the students to do it. It helps you broaden your context around the subject that you're interested in. 
being able to apply it into in a different uh, sort of uh, scenario, you know, different way and looking at uh, the topic in a more broader way. So it's definitely a good thing to do, and I would encourage candidates to do it. Whether that has an impact on your application, you know, if you aren't doing an EPQ and you are doing an EPQ, what each application is evaluated uh, again on a broad range of different criteria. So don't feel that you are being put at a disadvantage if you're not doing an EPQ. But if you do have the opportunity, do take it up. Brilliant, thank you. And for this uh, written work, um, can the EPQ be used for that? Uh, now that's a good question. I am not too sure about that. I might need David to come in on that one. Uh, David, are you able to answer that one? I mean, do students submit their EPQ work as part of their written work for the history applications? Um, we would typically be most interested in seeing examples of essay writing, which have been done as part of schoolwork. Um, sometimes these extended projects um, are very lengthy and therefore don't really lend themselves so well to uh, our interests and requirements. Um, so we would we would normally be looking at essays, and and the reason for that is that um, you know typically within Cambridge a weekly essay is 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 you know the most important skill for them to be able to master and we're looking typically at an essay on a on a weekly basis about two and a half thousand words um uh so i think that that would answer the question brilliant thank you um cam a question about four a levels um what's the impact of taking four a levels on an offer okay so um as I mentioned in my talk, the university uh, entry requirements are for three A-levels. Um, we require candidates to achieve an A-star and two A's for the A-levels. If a candidate is doing four A-levels, that's great. I wouldn't discourage them from doing that. I would encourage it. However, their offer will be based on three A-levels, achieving three A-levels if they were to apply to Downing. Um, the, the, the thing about whether the, a candidates are more advantage if they're doing four A-levels to three A-levels, when we are reviewing the application, again, I can't emphasize enough, this is not the only criteria, we look at other things as well, and you are not put at a disadvantage if you are doing only three A-levels um, instead of four. However, if you do decide to take four A-levels, that's absolutely great, and we would encourage that, because what you're doing is putting yourself through some more academic demand you know you're actually putting yourself through a, um, a, to, to work through a high content of academic work and all that's going to do is help you prepare for university because once you get to university your workload is going to go up even more so if you are able to adapt your working um, or the way you work to be able to cope with the content before a levels that would be a great thing to do brilliant thank you um lamorne i've got a question for you here and um, what's the best thing about studying history? Um, I think the thing that I've really enjoyed in my first year um, has actually been historical argument and practice. Um, I think because at GCSE and A-level, you're taught history in quite a formulaic way. Um, it's, it tends to be around high politics. Um, so I did the British Empire at A-level um, and we kind of studied colonial secretaries, prime ministers, things like that. Um, but in HAP, you look at history from loads of different angles and things that I didn't even realise were possible. Brilliant. Um, another question here, um, Cam and David, this one's probably uh, for you. Um, in the history interviews, is there anything in particular that makes uh, strong candidates stand out? Yes, I, maybe if I answer that, um, I mean, I think Cameron has already, in a way, given indication about that when he was talking about the ability to think through a problem um, and therefore uh, an ability to uh, wrestle potentially with material that you may not have previously encountered or, um, uh, or, or to take further an area of interest that you already have um, with an interview would certainly be uh, a strength. Um, and I, I would want to stress also that we're making our decisions on the basis of potential. So it is uh, an ability to, to communicate your own particular agenda as to what you want to use the history degree 
um, you know, what, which of the areas of study do you want to actually pursue within the history degree and, and why? Um, the way I see it is the history degree is offering an enormous menu of different choices covering a vast range of periods and regions. Um, and, uh, you know, we're looking for potential students who want to make the most of those opportunities and have a particular agenda that they want to pursue in the course of their degree. Ultimately, we're offering a form of professional training. At the end of the three years, it would be possible um, for most of our students to go off and do further research. We've given them the skills to do that. Only a small percentage will go on to do that. But um, it's not enough, if you like, simply to um, go through a number of the papers. Um, you know, we, we want you to be able to develop your own agenda as a historian. And I think a, a candidate that, that communicates why they want to spend the three years um, uh, studying this from this enormous menu um, uh, is something that we would take very seriously. Brilliant, thank you. Cam, did you have anything to add? Or? No, I think that's great. That covers it. I think that's quite good. It covers it. Great. Um, I think this will be um, the last question uh, that we've got time for. Um, so, Cam, um, with the personal statement, um, should the candidate offer examples of criticisms on books um, and materials that they have um, read? I think that's a good idea. I mean, being able to talk about a piece of literature you read and critiquing it and giving your opinions about it, it's quite good. It shows your thought process. I definitely encourage that. But at the same time, you've got to remember your personal statements, it's only five to 600 words. It's quite difficult to be able to critique a piece of work within that short span of time. So do plan out and structure your personal statement in a way where you cover all the information you want to present about yourself. But that's not a bad idea. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody, for answering my questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get um, round to your question. Um, hopefully we've answered most of them, um, but please feel free to email me um, afterwards if you haven't had your question answered or if you think of any others. Um, as a way of finishing um, the webinar then, um, could each of you give a piece of advice uh, to the Year 12s who are applying um, in October? Cam, I'll start with you if that's all right. Yeah, so my advice is make sure you, you research the course that you want to apply to properly. Um, think about what is it you want to study at university. Spend some time reading around the subject. The fact that you've attended this webinar is showing you who you are researching your subject, which is great. I will continue doing that. Um, and also, you know, read up uh, around your subject area. And if you have any questions about the application process, my advice to all candidates are please do get in touch with the college. We are here to help you and advise you through that process. Brilliant, thank you. David? Uh, yes, I would say look beyond um, the courses that you are currently studying at, at A-level. I know that can be difficult because, you know, the A-levels are themselves a challenge, but try to look beyond what you are currently studying. Think about what you want to be studying in the future and read around those subjects. Um, ask your teachers for advice on further reading. Um, use resources like the BBC History magazine or History Today to um, develop a, an awareness of um, new subject areas that you want to pursue in the future. Lamona? I think um, the best piece of advice that I got when I was applying um, was to treat the interview a bit like a mock supervision. Um, so don't kind of feel like you have to get every answer right because um, you really don't um, and I definitely didn't. Um, the main purpose is to just see if you're suited to that kind of teaching environment and to see how you communicate, interact, discuss, things like that. Um, so don't worry basically. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you all so much. And thank you all uh, for your talks as well. And thank you at home uh, for joining us this afternoon.